Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming to the show Mr. David Hunter. David is an investment professional and a precious metals expert. He is the chief macro strategist at Contrarian Macro Advisors. He is known as an independent thinker in finance, and when it comes to wealth, he is known as one of the best macro strategists in the world. We're honored to have him with us today. David, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Michelle. Thanks for having me. We are excited to have you here. David, we want to start off with the markets. What precisely is your forecast for the S&P 500, the Dow Jones, and the NASDAQ 100? I know you are extremely bullish on the market right now at the moment. What are you doing to position yourself with what you see? Sure. Um, I believe we're in the final stages of a 38-year secular bull market that started back in 1982. So what I'm looking for is a final um, what I call parabolic melt-up that is uh, going to kind of put the, the final uh, touches on, on what has been a great bull market for all these decades. Um, I'm looking for, for the S&P somewhere between 4,200 and 4,500, and I'm probably leaning more to the high side of that uh, range. Uh, and I think you could be there um, this quarter, and if not this quarter, certainly early next. Um, so I think we're going to see an awful lot of ground covered in a short time. I think the NASDAQ can get up to fourteen to 15,000, and um, the Dow probably up to 36,000. So those are big numbers, uh, kind, of, kind of returns that you would see or the kind of movement you'd see over the course of a couple of years or more, and we could see it over the course of a couple of months. And so, you know, that's what ends of cycles are. They tend to go parabolic, and you cover a lot of ground in a short time. Um, I think it's uh, going to be led by technology, as has been the case all this last few months. Um, but I think you're going to see some catch up in some of the laggard groups like energy, uh, which is starting to show a little more, a um, little better behavior the last day or two. Um, and uh, industrials, some of the things that have lagged, the cyclicals. Um, and it's probably telling you that we are going to see this economy um, pick up speed. I do believe we're in a, a V recovery. Um, we created so much money and put pumped so much money in from both the Fed and the Treasury that uh, with a lag, you'll see that in the third and fourth quarters. I don't think it's sustainable because uh, what I call a global bust or what the virus has done to us has created some real permanent damage in certain aspects of the economy. So you can, you can engineer this recovery but I don't think it's sustainable. So following that, we go back down uh, in what I call the second stage of the bust, uh, and I think the, economy, the uh, stock market will follow. But, but for the next two or three months, uh, it's pretty clear sailing, pretty, pretty exciting times. I love that term, the parabolic melt-up. Yeah, it's, um, you know, if you go back to obviously 2000, the, the tech bubble, or you go back to the Nifty 50 in 1974, 1973, um, you, you get at the ends of these cycles, oftentimes a very steep, the slope just gets steeper and steeper as you move towards the end. And I think we're in that end stage now where it's just moving into the melt up now, I think. So I think uh, you know, August and September could be pretty exciting. Oh, wonderful. Expound just a little bit. You touched on what portions, what segments of the market you're looking at. Where are you really focused? Well, I think um, what I've said, and I've said this um, since the bottom in March, I, I feel like the semiconductors, the um, precious metal and mining area, um, and um, the fangs, you know, the, the social media stocks, would lead this market to its final end. And usually you see in a cycle that, you know, the, um, like Fang and, and semiconductors have been strong through the whole cycle. They tend to stay strong right to the end and then they don't lead the next cycle. But, but um, the miners are kind of a new thing. They've come on in the last year and yeah, they just broke out really in the last few days. Uh, and you're starting to see some tremendous returns coming in there. I think they have a long runway ahead here in the next few months. 
Um, you know, gold is uh, uh, just about 18, almost 1850. Uh, I would not be surprised to see 2300 in the next few months. Uh, silver is at 21 and change. Um, that's up from, you know, 1450, not that long ago. And I see that going to 35 in the next, uh, before the end of this year. So, so you've got some big moves coming in the metals themselves, and the miners will be big beneficiaries of that. Um, you know, I'm looking for uh, some pretty sizable moves in both gold and silver mining. How long do you think that will last as far as precious metals go? Well, for this, um, for this move, it's probably going to coincide with the stock market. So, you know, if the market uh, moves through this quarter and into early next quarter or ends this quarter, I'd say the miners are probably going to pretty much uh, mimic that in terms of timing. And then when, when we get a uh, bear market in stocks, I think you'll get a correction in the miners and the, and the metals. Um, but I do think from a longer-term standpoint, there's a big leg ahead. The next cycle, because of all the money we're creating now, once we get through this, and that's probably 2022, I think 2021 is a uh, you know, pretty bad economic year. But once we get into a recovery year starting in 2022, I think that recovery will be the first inflation recovery cycle we've had since the 1970s. So, you know, it's been uh, going on uh, 40, 40 plus years since we've seen, or 40 years since we've seen that kind of a, a cycle. And um, I think inflation will probably retrace much of the last 40 years. So you go from negative inflation or deflation next year to potentially high double digit inflation before the end of the decade. That will drive the metals and mining area. I think they will be to this next cycle, not now, but the, the recovery cycle and starting in 2022, they will be to that cycle what dot com was to the 90s. So it'll be the lead group um, I think commodities in general do very well during that period, but I would not be surprised to see gold at $10,000 by the end of this decade. I wouldn't be surprised to see silver at something north of $300. So obviously those are big moves. Huge moves. Now, um, let's talk about timing just a little bit because you spoke about 2021 being a crash year. Um, so you're looking at the big melt up this year and then coming fairly soon after that when you're looking at that what are you continuing to watch and have you um, already pulled some things out of the market in anticipation of that or what is your strategy right now yeah i don't really um i don't uh talk so much about market strategy in terms of people have to kind of decide for themselves based on their own risk parameters, you know, how to position. I will say that um, we're in an unusual time in that, um, you know, if you do the, the math, you know, being at 3,200, 3,300 on the S&P, and I'm talking about 42, 43, 4,500, you know, you're talking about um, another, say, 35 to 40% upside um, that could occur in less than three months' time may take longer, but I think could occur in less than three months' time. Um, so you're talking about, uh, you know, if you can get 30 or 40% in three years' time, that's a great return, right? So, so it's kind of a funny thing that the timing, the, the period of time that it'll take to cover that ground, it seems like it's near at hand. So you have to, you know, you have to start thinking about how do I structure for the other side of the mountain. But from a standpoint of returns, your years, you know, your what would normally be years worth of returns away from it. So, so I guess my my comment on that is, you know, people have to decide when they're comfortable. But it's so easy to say, well, if we're going to top out this year, I want to start, you know, getting liquid now, or I want to start getting defensive now. And you're going to sit there with regrets while you watch what could have been some tremendous returns happen in the next couple months. So, so that's, I mean, I I don't provide advice as to how people structure, but I, I do think they need to understand that a parabolic can be very quick, but it can also include some very, very nice returns on the upside. So, you know, you try to walk that line. Um, in terms of the other side, you know, what I'm saying is that we, we had what I think is the initial part of a global bust because of the virus, you know, what did us in March 
and April and May, um, because of the response from the central banks and from uh, the Treasury, um, we've had so much money far beyond anything we've ever seen in previous cycles um, put into the system. With a lag, you get a recovery as a result of that, or you get a snapback as a result of that. You know, consumer demand starting to pick up. Uh, autos are obviously seeing some demand. Housing seeing demand. Um, and so you do get a couple quarters where you could have some statistically very nice rebound. Um, however, you still have hotels, restaurants, uh, cruise lines, airlines, uh, and lots of businesses that are struggling because they were shut down for several months. And many of those may not make it back. In fact, certainly in the restaurant area, a lot have already closed. Um, we've, we've, got a, we've come into this um, bust with tremendous amount of uh, debt on the, uh, on the system. So globally, we have $250 trillion in, in debt. And as I like to say, we also have quadrillions in notional value of derivatives, which I consider another form of leverage. So we came into this with leverage like we've never seen before. And then we got hit with this very surprising downturn, very fast, sharp downturn. That's a combination that can really create havoc for the global economy and will. And that's what I think 2021 is about, is you get through a couple quarters of rebound, and then you go right back into trouble. And the second part of the, the bust is when you deal with the insolvencies. You know, you can kind of postpone insolvencies by pumping money, but then when things roll over, uh, they don't have the staying power. And you're going to see a, a huge cycle of bankruptcies and, and probably globally some big bank failures. You know, I think Europe's got some real potential problems. Um, some of the Asian banks could run into problems. So, so I think we're going to see in 2021 something far worse than what we saw in the um, second quarter. And that's what will hit the market very hard you know, once we get through this melt-up. So in a nutshell, you're looking for this melt-up, this fabulous bull market for the next couple of months, probably till the end of 2020. So stock market, precious metals, things that you can invest in that are tangible and also as far as, um, do you like mining stocks specifically? And what is your view on physical compared to paper precious metals? Yeah, from, from the standpoint of individual names, I don't, as a strategist, I don't get into individual names. So it's all from a macro standpoint, top down. Um, in terms of uh, physical versus paper, I, I don't have a strong opinion on that. Obviously, physical, um, from a longer term standpoint, will be, uh, you know, it has, has the real interest of a lot of people who want that security of holding the asset rather than the paper. And, you know, we could run into paper issues. I don't think, I don't think we're going to see um, real um, issues with the, you know, the ETFs that are futures based or paper based um, in this cycle. As we get to the end of the decade, uh, once we've had this break run up in metals, um, you know, that's the time when I think we could start seeing some, you know, the, the excesses could have created some problems with paper. But um, I think, you know, I think people can probably feel comfortable being in paper assets at this point. That's wonderful news. So you don't see paper as really being a problem until sometime near toward the end of the decade. So at this current time, beautiful bull market. Let's talk about the crash of um, next year. 2021. Um, first of all, do you see it starting at the beginning of the year? Do you see it as being a fast crash or do you see it sort of being a downhill slide? That's my first question. Okay, sure. Actually, I, I think it could begin as early as uh, the end of this quarter or the beginning of the next quarter. So more likely it's most of it will happen after the election. Um, but you know, I think it could begin the end, before the end of this year. Um, and so, so that's what I mean by it's, you know, literally two to three months from a, a top, even though we're still talking 30 or 40% upside. So um, could begin in the fourth quarter. 
Um, I think it's going to be very fast. Um, I think the potential is there, and again, who knows for sure, but I think the potential is there. Given the quadrillions in derivatives, any move that will exacerbate it and speed it up. So um, I think there's a potential for the unwind, what I call the unwind, to be faster than what we saw in 2008-9. So you could, you could cover, and by the way, I'm looking for potentially, and it doesn't have to be this large, but I think the potential is there for as much as an 80% downside peak to trough. So if we, let's say we top out on the S&P at 4,500, um, you could be looking at something just under 1,000 on the S&P as the bottom of the bear market. So that would be, you know, you're covering potentially, you know, 3,500 points downside. Um, again, who knows? I don't have a crystal ball to say for sure. But the setup is there, given the leverage in the system, for this unwind to be very steep and very fast. Um, and you could, you could have days where the Dow Jones Industrial Average could lose a few thousand points in a day. Who knows? You know, we'll see, I think we'll see some historic moves. We saw certainly how fast things can unwind back in March. You know, we had the, the fastest three-week decline, biggest three-week decline ever. Uh, in the history of the market back in March. So that's, a, I think, a precursor of, of, you know, coming attractions. Right. <laughs> coming attractions. Now, David, um, you've brought up the printing of the money a couple of different times. Currently, right now, if you were the Secretary of the United States Treasury instead of Steve Mnuchin, what would be your economic plan? Yeah, I think I'm, it's a funny thing, and I, you, you will hear me say or see me say out there, because um, there's obviously a real narrative out there that says we, you know, the, the more the Fed than the Treasury, we but both have been recklessly spending and, and printing, and uh, it's, you know, it's going to be a disaster. And I would say to you that in the current times, if the Fed and the Treasury did not what, do what they did, things would have been much worse and that there's this narrative out there that somehow we just have to let things go their natural way. And if we let them go their natural way and not try to print our way out of it or what have you, that somehow we'll cleanse the system and be able to start fresh. Uh, I think that's, you know, that's a view of an awful lot of people out there. And I think that's um, kind of naive. I, I would tell you that, um, if, if they didn't respond, um, that we would probably be in something for many years and wouldn't be able to pull ourselves out. And so what they're doing is kind of they were dealt with, a, they were dealt a hand, meaning that's been building up over four or five decades. So it's not Jay Powell's fault. It's not Steve Mnuchin's fault, but they are contributing to it. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of money created and a lot of um, debt created here. Um, so they are obviously putting a lot more onto what was already a, a hefty load. But my problem is, what's the alternative? The alternative is not to do it. And then, you know, we, we suffer the consequences sooner and, and longer. Um, so I, I am not opposed to what they're doing. I'm not in that camp, uh, which I call the, particularly the Austrian camp, um, in terms of um, saying, you know, Fed's terrible and Jay Powell's terrible, et cetera. I was actually pretty critical of Jay Powell, probably as critical as anybody on the street back in 2018 and through the first half of 2019 because I felt he, he, was, he was caught in that narrative saying, we've got to show discipline, we've got to pull money out of the system. And I said, you're going to create a recession uh, and that recession because of the debt is going to turn into something far worse than you expect. And fortunately, he kind of got the message mid-year last year and then got a much bigger message when things hit in March. And he responded, I, as I've said, I've been fairly complimentary of him of late, uh, particularly beginning in March, saying he did the right things. He was, uh, I had for a long time said he's, you know, he's learning on the job. He was an attorney and, and not a, an economist. And but um, as of March, I said he's been a fast learner. You know, he's catching up and he's doing the right thing. So, so I'm not critical of them now. 
Uh, what I do think, and, and the other thing, what I was starting to say before, is I, I like to say, and on Twitter and elsewhere, I'll say sometimes, you know, I'm, I'm forecasting what's happening. I'm not moralizing about what's happening. So, in other words, it's almost an inevitability we're going to see this. Whether it's right or wrong, the seeds were sown 40 years ago when we started really building up that and, you know, all the private equity uh, um, organizations that went crazy, et cetera. But, you know, we're, we're leveraged to the hill everywhere you go, not just in the U.S., but all around the world and not, not in any one particular sector, but across sectors. Um, you know, we, we, the, the time to have been critical should have been 20 and 30 years ago. It's now that we've been at Delta's hand, you got to try to deal with it the best you can. And unfortunately, right or wrong, our, you know, our tr Treasury and our Fed are not going to let things just fall apart. And nor should they. If, you know, we're not a country that's just going to say, okay, we're going to have 50% of the population out on the street because we want to cleanse the system. That's just not going to happen. And if they let this thing fall, that's what you would see. So, so you know, you can moralize all you want and talk about how we shouldn't be printing money, et cetera. The reality is there's no choice given the hand that's been built. That is such an interesting perspective, um, certainly contrarian, um, yeah. because everyone is so down on the Federal Reserve for how much money they've printed and scared that they're printing our money into worthlessness. I think that is, is the whole point. But your point is, with the equation, the hand they were dealt, what else could they do to keep the economy going? Now, now that this anyway, happened... Just say, not only what else could they do, um, the reality is, knowing the system, what else would they do? You know, even if you could say they shouldn't do this, it's just not realistic that they would do anything else because, like I said, we're not a country that's going to allow our people to just go into poverty and, and say, well, yeah, it's going to be painful for the next five years, but we want to correct the debt, you know? And so now it does lead to, not to jump ahead, but it does lead to that hyperinflationary cycle I'm talking about. And then beyond that, towards the end of the decade, the beginning of the next decade, you could see a collapse of the system because it just went too far. So um, I'm not saying this ends well. I'm not, you know, naively saying what they're doing is great. Right. Right. They did what they had to do at that moment in time, which is all anyone can do at any stage in life in any situation. But um, when you say you don't see it ending well, what is your perspective on this? Yeah, I think, I think we, what I call a, a global bust here is differentiated from a depression because it happens, it's, it, as I say, it's the magnitude of a depression that can cause the kind of, uh, while you're in it, the feeling of a depression, but a depression is normally drawn out, and so you have pain for year after year after year, like the Great Depression, um, whereas the bust can be contained within a year or 18 months. Um, when we get to the end of the next recovery cycle, I think we see a collapse of the system, and I think we will have a decade-long, maybe multi-decade-long depression. So I don't think it ends well. <laughs> um, I think it will be um, something that uh, nobody wants to face, but it's, I, I don't know how we get out of this when you look at the, the mountain of debt. Uh, it's going to be worse. I, I do think um, next year you'll see if you think we've seen a lot of money created and a lot of debt created so far this year, wait till next year. It's going to be far, far more. Um, so, you know, we're going to just be piling debt on top of debt. Uh, it will pull us out of this bust, um, but, and it will give us a multi year recovery of maybe five, seven years, uh, and then following that. But just imagine if you have 250 trillion in debt now. Globally, that could rise to something closer to 375 or 400 trillion in debt, um, or at least 350 to 400, um, you know, by the end of the decade. And that that has to be financed and refinanced. And it's easier, you know, it's not such a big deal when you're financing your debt at, you know, one percent or zero. 
um, wait till that interest rate has risen to, because of inflation, that interest rate has risen into double digit territory. How do we finance our debt? How does the world finance its debt when interest rates are in double digits? You know, it'll, it'll be impossible. The math doesn't work out. David, I want to turn to politics just for a moment, because I want to ask you, how will the upcoming presidential election impact the global economy that you see coming? And what are the consequences of each candidate, Democrat or Republican? Is there a difference? There's a huge difference in policies. I mean, probably as big a difference as there's ever been. Um, And it's, um, you know, we've already heard some of the, the commentary about Biden's proposed economic plan where he's he's openly said he will uh, raise taxes on you know the higher income levels and raise corporate taxes significantly um, that's tough on Wall Street I mean you know that will that will hit uh, the bottom line in many corporations obviously so so from a economic policy standpoint just tax policy standpoint for sure there's a big difference between uh, Donald Trump who is all about cutting taxes, uh, all about uh, lowering regulation, and the Joe Biden who's very much going to reverse that lowering of a regulation, go right back to much higher regulation, much higher taxes, um, and and from a wh- where they don't differ, they the rhetoric used to be the Republicans um, were the fiscal um, conservatives and would be working on controlling spending. And the Democrats were the, you know, known to be, you know, spend at all costs. Um, because of where we're at, basically, there's not a lot of difference between what you can get in the Democrat administration versus the Republican administration um, this time around, you know, meaning the next four years, because of the economy. I mean, and we're seeing that play out here. We've, you know, we've never seen Republicans agree to a $3 trillion um, you know, spending package in one one time and come back two months later with, now they may be talking about a trillion for the, you know, the one that we're looking at right now. I'm, and the House has proposed three trillion. I'm guessing before it's done, it'll be a compromise of somewhere between one and a half and two trillion. So, so that's almost $5 trillion okayed in, you know, a matter of months. That's not typical Republican style. But it's where we're at economically. So, so I would say from a fiscal standpoint, there may not be a huge difference between the two parties. There, there'll be a lot of difference in their rhetoric, but the reality will be that both sides are going to have to stimulate the economy. So that part, you'll see not, you know, not a lot of um, difference. But on a tax policy side, I think, I think a Biden could hurt the stock market, you know, and you know, again, I'm looking more at the cycle being the reason why we have a bear market, but certainly a Biden election, a a Biden victory would contribute to the downside. Hmm. What would happen with um, the re-election of the president? I think you would see, um, as we've seen here, um, Wall Street would generally be happier. Um, and you would see a continuation of the move away from globalism towards, uh, and actually, I think the next cycle um, will be a cycle driven by industrial. Like I said, it'll be an inflation driven recovery, but also an industrial driven recovery. And it will have a lot to do with reshoring or bringing back our capacity from China. Um, and obviously under Donald Trump, that's for sure going to happen. But I think, I think even, uh, under a Democratic administration, there's enough sentiment in the country now and in Congress to see that happen. Certainly in the pharmaceutical area, in the healthcare area, we want to bring capacity back here. We we saw what happened when our PPE supplies were all supplied out of China. So, so I think that's already in the works. But I also think uh, more so under a, a Donald Trump presidency, but you will see um, steel mill capacity may be built here for the first time in decades. You, you'll see, you know, auto capacity come back. And, and some of it will be uh, in the U.S. and some of it will be this North American, um, you know, union between Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. Um, I think the, um, 
USMCA um, agreement was huge in terms of now that we're kind of moving away from China and moving away from globalism, a North American kind of trade union um, where they all have kind of figured this thing out um, labor-wise, et cetera, I think is going to be very, very good for the U.S. and, and our trading partners here in North America and, and also kind of timely. Right. Do you think that is part of the solution of pulling our country out of this? Because what we're looking at, even though it's going to be great for the next two to three months in your prediction, then we hit that crash and then you see another rise for the next five to seven years. But beyond that, what you're saying to us is that we have a debt that's insurmountable and will not be able to be refinanced and we've got nowhere to go from there. So in that meantime, what are the solutions and is bringing jobs and companies back onshore part of that? You would think so. I think it's a main part of it. I, I, even globally, I think what you're going to see is consumers has been the driving force of the, not only the U.S. economy, but the global economy for, for decades. You know, really, we started disinflation back in uh, the early 80s after we peaked in inflation. And it's been many decades where the rate, you know, inflation came down, interest rates came down, money was readily available for consumers, uh, housing prices went up, and it was a, you know, very long consumer spending cycle. Uh, you know, the whole shop till you drop type of mentality that was built in in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Uh, that's coming to an end. What, what the virus did would have come anyway, but it really accelerated it where the consumer's been hit hard. Don't forget, they got hit in 2008-9 with subprime and with um, the big hit to the stock market. They got hit in 2000 with the, you know, the big tech bubble break. Um, so wealth was taking hits along the way already, and now we're about to have another one. We started it in March, but we'll have a much bigger hit to it um, in the bear market. Um, and so, um, you know, I don't think the consumer is going to be the driving force of our economy going forward. Um, it was, you know, up to 70% of the economy here in the last decade or two. It's going to probably take a back seat for several years as in, and what will replace will be that industrial demand. So it's going to be a cycle of, um, I think government spending for infrastructure will help fuel industrial. So, and infrastructure means anything from military spending to, you know, rebuilding our airports, rebuilding our roads and bridges and, and electric grid, you know, all those kind of things. Um, 5G will be, will require a lot of infrastructure, you know, build out. Um, and so I think government spending will be a part of it. They'll be private, but they'll also be, I think, government. And again, this is a U.S. story, but it's also we're going to see parallels to that, I think, around the globe. Um, and, and then on top of that is this whole thing of capacity coming back here as companies reassess and say, it's not just looking at labor costs. It's also looking at the costs that come with a, you know, a, a trading partner that isn't necessarily reliable or, you know, has some other motives than just, you know, providing us with cheap capacity. So, so I think there'll be, you know, company management saying, yeah, it may cost us a little more to build here in North America, um, but it's going to be worth it from the standpoint of all the other factors that go into it. So, you know, building out new factories and all that, we haven't really seen that in the last many years. You know, it hasn't, we've, been, we've been farming out our capacity for years, for decades. And to have that come back our way is certainly going to be a big contributor to GDP, I think, in the, in the next decade. Beautiful. And it would be great for Americans and for our security going forward, too, just to know that we've, you know, we make our own, we have our own, you know, just in case something should happen. And you just brought up the geopolitical um, standpoint of the motives another country might have um, uh, aside from offering us cheap things. And I know you're talking about 
China. I want to get your take on um, the Chinese Communist Party and the impact they've had on the United States. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I will, I will even say the impact Donald Trump has had, because really, if you look, it's really been he that was, when he first came into office and was kind of very negative towards China, although, um, you know, he tried to, you know, play the game of he's my friend or whatever, but basically his rhetoric was pretty tough on China. And now you see that that, uh, and people may not want to credit him with it, but that tends to be the viewpoint of our country now is that, hey, China's not just this trading part partner that we um, dealt with and where, you know, there was a lot of potential growth out there. People are now seeing China for what I think they are, which is they are a communist country and they have uh, been doing a lot of um, espionage in this country and stealing technology from us. And, and they're also basically very, they're very expansionary in terms of what they're doing in the South China Sea and, you know, with, um, you know, the move on Hong Kong and what seems to be, uh, uh, you know, design on Taiwan. And, you know, uh, it's, yeah, I think our country has shifted to where I think there's a general sense where I don't think there was three or four years ago that China's not our, you know, isn't thought first as a trading partner. They're almost thought first as a, a potential enemy. And um, where that goes, I'm not sure. I'm not forecasting World War Three, but I, I do think that, you know, there's going to be a, at least a Cold War here going forward in the next decade. And I think, um, frankly, it was long overdue in terms of we were really kind of asleep at the switch with a lot of the stuff going on, you know, here in this country with China. Um, and, and by the way, I think we tend to think of um, the two parties, you know, Democrats and Republicans. I, th I think it's more today um, somewhat of a split between globalists and and anti-globalists. So, you know, Donald Trump obviously is spearheading the anti-globalist movement, this whole, you know, more nationalistic, um, you know, bring capacity back here, focus on what's good for America. Um, you know, that's, that's a big sea change from where we were, both on Wall Street and in the public at large. There was always this general idea that globalism is good, you know, it, it leads to more growth, etc. I think I think you're seeing a pretty big shift there. Yeah, it was really fiercely touted, uh, especially throughout the Obama administration, the global perspective and the UN perspective and bringing us all under that one umbrella and whatnot. And of course, you know, this goes pretty far back from, you know, um, first, um, Bush Sr., you know, when he first started off, you know, we, we will see this. It's coming, this um, one world, new world order. Um, yeah, I just, I, I wanted to get your, you know, as an economist, your perspective on that. So you really see bringing items home. I think many Americans, as you mentioned, are definitely starting to see the value of that, the independence of that. So we're not so dependent upon a country that might not turn out to be our friend. I think that's probably. Yeah, and I think it, it, again, it will be not just a U.S. thing. I think you will see um, Europe uh, to one degree or another. We're, we're obviously seeing it play out in, in the whole Huawei um, thing where UK has turned their back on Huawei and, uh, India has turned their back on them. Um, the U.S. obviously is. So you're beginning to see people much more suspicious of China's motives. And, um, and then there's, there's just, I think, for this country, um, it also brings jobs back at that lower level. I mean, we've had this huge income gap that has grown and grown for the last couple of decades, it's really accelerated to the point where, you know, we, we all know it, you know, the, the top 1% control so much of the wealth in this country. And um, a lot of that was the lost jobs, you know, the good paying jobs in the Rust Belt that went overseas over the last 20 or 30 years, you know, you lost um, 
jobs that were paying very hefty amounts. And those people, if they found another job, were making half of what they used to make. Uh, it led to, obviously, a lot of um, drug problems in the cities, you know, the industrial cities. Uh, you know, uh, you go into Detroit or Cleveland or Pittsburgh, or uh, Pittsburgh's done a good job of kind of remaking themselves. But, uh, you know, a lot of the Rust Belt cities really suffered greatly from the loss of these big factories. Um, so... I think it will be, and again, I, I think it's going to come for us pretty fast compared to the last many years where we watched everything go out, but it's still going to have to happen over time. It's not going to be an you know, instant, um, all these factories come back, but I, I think there's going to be a movement back that way. I think you're right. I think that was a huge aspect. They're talking about the wealth gap, the divide between the poor and the rich, because all of our, when you send all of our jobs overseas and then people have to, a good paying job goes overseas because it's cheaper there. And then people have to take lower paying jobs and lower paying jobs. And that's the cycle. And then they can't build their, you know, they can't afford their homes and they can't afford education for their children and they can't afford anything. And then pretty soon they're talking about their parents were much better off than their children will ever be. And I think you hit on exactly what caused it. Yeah, and, and we kind of just, it happened so gradually, um, you know, we can look back and say, wow, you know, that's so obvious, but it happens kind of over so many years that, um, and we're sold the bill of goods that this is, this is the way the economy works, you know, the comparative advantage, you, you have production go where it's cheapest to produce, and that it, you know, all, all ships will rise because of that. That just hasn't proven to be the fact, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think this is going to be a real game changer. The problem is because of everything that's happened over so many decades and because of what I think we're getting here with this huge monetary buildup and then, um, you know, soon thereafter having to finance, having to finance the debt at much higher rates, you don't have a long runway to make this happen if this were – 20 years ago, it could be a huge renaissance for this country. Uh, I don't think we're going to have that luxury because of other, you know, other macro factors. So for the next five, seven, eight years, um, you know, it'll be, you'll definitely see that trend, but that's not a long time in terms of building out factories and stuff. It takes a while to get that stuff going. Um, and, and then the other theme, which is the opposite of that, which is that the consumers just not going to be able to, you know, propel the economy. They're, they're going to be digging out from everything that happens this cycle, you know, this down cycle. Mm. So we have a definitive timeline, basically, to get back on track, and the way to do it is to bring jobs home, to build all of our factories back, our steel mills, everything, exactly what the president's talking about. I'm seeing this crystal clear now why he's so focused upon that. He's always talking about bringing infrastructure home, but that's really rebuilding the middle class so that everyone can get homes again and, st you know, and get back on course. Um, it's yeah, tragic. Is, yeah, it is tragic. And the irony here is that the Democrats have always been the party of labor. And you're seeing that shift because the working class is seeing Donald Trump's policies are really more pro, um, pro working class. You know, he's trying to get jobs back. You know, it started with the, the um, oil patch, you know, the whole shale oil thing are, you know, the, the engine of, of jobs for the last three and a half years under, under Trump have been, were, were focused in the um, shale oil and, Obviously, that took a big um, hit in starting in March, you know, with the, the, you know, when the virus hit, we got the double whammy of oil, the oil glut hitting. So that kind of shut that down. That will come back, by the way. I haven't talked about oil, but I expect oil uh, prices to go to 300 bucks a barrel or maybe higher before the end of the decade. So that will be part of that whole inflation cycle, um, too. And so... Um, that will certainly bring the oil patch back. And, you know, I don't think, no matter who's in, I don't think there's any way we're going to, even if even if Biden wins and you get a Green New Deal, um, 
there's no way that it's going to move fast enough to supply the kind of capacity of energy that we need anytime soon. You know, they, they, they just can't, uh, even in their most aggressive um, estimates, get there. So you're going to need, um, you know, carbon fuels. You're going to need oil and gas. And so I think we have a big, along with the fresh smells, I think the energy sector is going to be one of the big winners in the next cycle. That's what I just wanted to talk to you. I want to bring it back to everyone. Um, so I want to, you, you've covered so much ground here. It's been so amazing. So I want to nutshell it in that next two to three months, fabulous bull market across the board. Then we're looking at a crash. And what we're looking at is the beginning of incredible inflation. So how does everyone prepare themselves and what are the best sections to be in right now? Um, you just mentioned um, a couple of them. Please cover that for us. Yeah, sure. Um, by the way, tw 20, just to clear it up, 2021, because uh, I wasn't sure I was very clear about it, I do think we will see negative inflation or so-called deflation in 2022 or 2021. We haven't had deflation since the Great Depression. We haven't had widespread deflation. Uh, and this will be a global deflationary bust. So we're going to see negative inflation next year. Uh, maybe substantial negative inflation in this country, meaning you could have deflation of three or four percent, maybe five percent next year. That's that's something we haven't seen in the post World War II era. So that's a big deal. But with the money printing, we will come out of that by 2022 and have that inflation cycle. So um, to circle back, I just want to make that clear because I hadn't really said anything about deflation. Um, but to circle back around, I think. Between now and the top, the sectors, as I said before, I think technology will continue to lead. Precious metals and mining will continue to lead. I think you'll have catch-up um, rallies in energy stocks, in, semi in um, uh, banking stocks, in um, industrial companies like Caterpillar, that kind of company. Um, and then... Um, and again, within a few months, I think we top out. So this is just really kind of um, the finishing touches on the 38-year bull market. Then we go through uh, what is going to be a very hard period, you, you know, the whole buy and hold mentality of riding things through. I think this is the kind of cycle you don't want to try to ride through because 80% um, down, you have to dig out of an awfully big hole. So. If, if we get anything close to that, 60, 70, 80% down in the market, um, you know, to get back to even, you're going to have to have a huge, huge run. I have said um, often that the, the top in this market, the secular top, we probably won't revisit the highs that we see in the next few months again for decades. So let's say we get to 4,500 on the S&P. Next even with all the industrial um, uh, growth that we see next, cycle, next cycle, the recovery cycle, I doubt that we get anywhere near 4,500. And the reason for that is because interest rates will be rising. They'll go from negative rates or zero uh, to where the 10 year might get up to 15% again by the end of the decade. So PE ratios, price earnings ratios are inverse what interest rates do and so if you have rates rising uh pe multiples will be falling so even if you have you know a lot of sectors making good money you're going to be capitalizing those earnings at much lower pe ratios or you know at much lower uh capitalization rates so so um that will put a cap on how far the market can rebound so even if you and, and if you're coming out of an 80 percent hole You've got a long way to go to get back to even anyway. Um, so I think you'll have a very big cyclical bull market, but this is a secular bull top, which means we're going to be in a secular bear all through the next decade or more, um, probably a couple decades. So, you know, if you go back way back in history, you know, way back 40 years ago when I was early in my career, you know, the Dow for a couple I don't know, it was a couple of decades, was, didn't get above 1,000. 
And then it finally broke above 1,000 in 1982, and we haven't looked back since. Um, this is going to be the reverse of that, where you, you, know, you have this, this cap on the market, and you're never going to, you know, for many years, you're not going to be able to break through that. Wow. It's going to be a very interesting time. David, this has been an amazing interview. Please tell everyone how they can contact you and where they can go to find your work. Yeah, most of my stuff that they, if they want to see me, I'm on Twitter. Um, and so I'm um, at my Twitter handle is at Dave H. Contrarian. And uh, I'm, I'm there usually every day with uh, my, you know, macro views, um, talking about the economy and, and the markets and once in a while I get into a little bit of a debate with somebody over monetary policy or something like that. But, um, that's, that's usually the best way to find me. Um, and, uh, I, I have a macro letter that I, um, uh, put out as well. So, um, it's, you know, by subscription. So great stuff. What's your advice for everyone going into this, what you're seeing is an incredible, bear a decade possibly too you know we've been through an incredible secular bull market for um 38 years and i think we're coming towards the end of that so um you know strategies that worked for many decades may not and i think what we're going to find for the first time in a long time is active management will outperform will will be the place to be in the um, you know the 2022 to 2028 type uh, time period, and so I would say for people just realize that what what worked in this cycle may not work in the next one because we're entering a very different world. Right, right. This has been amazing. We will have you back soon, especially as we start to hit the top of that bull market because this is going to be exciting. Yeah, it's certainly going to be. I think history in the making. Beautiful. David, thank you so much for coming on this show today. Thanks, Michelle, for uh, inviting me. Yes. Mr. David Hunter, investment professional, precious metals expert, and the chief macro strategist at Contrarian Macro Advisors for the Industry Experts Panel. I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.